I'm one generation removed. My grandfather was an incredible entrepreneur. I think he had 10 different businesses at the same time. Since everything was levied against him, the bank called in his loan and he lost the farmland. Started my business, started okay. selling produce at the farmer's markets. I started the farm in 2012 up okay. in, in West Michigan. We moved here in 2015. It, there was definitely some challenges. It's a different culture completely. And being from the North, if you're interested in farming, take risks, yeah. take chances. It can be a hard to take that initial first step. The biggest classroom is where you're at. Um, you are Nathan and this is Growing Greens. Is it family farm? That is correct. Okay. And it's family farm because your parents live here with you as well in a separate house yes. on the property. That's awesome. And it was our aspiration to have a multi-generational farm. So okay. my brother-in-law is actually a business partner in the farm with me. So it okay. was really unique how that came to be. So we're very family oriented. He homeschools his children. So okay. they are constantly on the farm. You'll probably see him running about a yeah. bit later. Awesome. But it's such a rich environment to raise kids on. Yeah. And we're uh, really hoping once my father retires, he's wanting to join the farm as well. Okay. So we'll definitely have that multi-generational aspect. Why multi-generational? Do you come from a multi-generational farming background or is it just something that you've decided you want? It was actually one of the things that helped uh, create the incentive to start a farm. My dad grew up on a farm. Okay. So I'm one generation removed. My grandfather was an incredible entrepreneur. I think he had 10 different businesses at the same time. Wow. And since everything was levied against him, the bank called in his loan and he lost the farmland. Oh no. So he, my dad went into construction, but his heart has always been in agriculture, and as has mine. It's, I, I guess once it's in your blood, it's always in your blood. Yeah, so I would agree with that. So there's always been that element of wanting to get back to the land. Okay. So it started for me when I was 10 years old. I just started a vegetable garden, a flower garden. Okay. And then started working at a neighboring farm at the age of 14. And from there just kept on growing. And then when it time to, or came time to go to pursue my education, I was like, what do I want to do? I love farming. So I actually pursued a degree in business, just knowing that I knew so much about agriculture already. But if you don't know the business and financing of business, mm. then the chances of failures is higher. Yeah. So we just saw that as a, a good meshing, especially since I took all the AP classes in high school in biology, chemistry, physics. Yeah. So I had a good understanding. How interesting. Was that your idea to get a business degree or was that like a family idea effort? My parents definitely influenced that idea. Okay. Especially since farming is hard yeah. and the margins can be slim at times. So they knew as well, and it was great foresight. If the farm didn't make it, it's much easier to enter into the workplace with a business degree than it is with just a biology degree, for instance. Yeah. So I saw great wisdom in that, uh, just having contingency plans because you don't know what life will throw at you. Did you work on farms like after you got your business degree or did you immediately jump into your own farm? So it was interesting how that happened. The farm I was working at was a hydroponic farm in West Michigan. Things were starting to just, or they were starting to buy produce that I was growing actually. So I was like, why? work for someone else when there's a need for more farmers that's the bottom line especially yeah. special or especially specialty crop farm actually freshman year in college i stopped working for them started my business started okay. selling produce at the farmers markets and it was amazing just to see what type of relationships opened up through that yeah in particular with like chefs chefs would come to the farmers market and they're like oh you're new on the block and before I knew it, there was enough income coming in from the business while I was pursuing my education to make, pay my way through college. That's really cool. So it was really encouraging, especially since I didn't want that financial burden. Yeah. Uh, I'm a, a fan of Dave Ramsey's and his mentality of stay out of debt if you can, especially right. when you're young. And yeah. that has definitely served us well. That's really cool. And I'm in, deeply intrigued by the idea that you knew you wanted to farm you went and got a business degree, you started farming, and here you are still farming. Have you had like bumps in the road as far as like, do I want to farm? Do I not want to farm? Questions, or has it always just been like, nope, farming's it, and here we go? Pretty well, farming's been it. It's something that I just breathe. I'm alive. It brings yeah. such life to me. So when people ask, so what do you do outside of the farming? I read about farming. <laughs> I love it. I have a homestead. So like I work with the animals on our land. So there's definitely an element of just being in nature that, that that's where I feel I am meant to be. I love it. So, so this is the home farm. That is and great. at the home farm, you've got all your vegetables. So you said in this time of year, things are pretty full. So we've got tons of beds here with vegetables. Your greenhouse has vegetables more over here and up there and over there. 
how much are you growing right now and what what varieties or maybe special varieties are you growing? So on this location, we're just a bit under a half acre of production. And this time of year, it's a lot of alliums that are started. So we have everything from scallions, leeks, sca or shallots, garlic that are coming up. Okay. We purposely try to plant those on the outside of our beds with the intention of keeping this interior open for your salad greens. Since on our farm, we do not use any sprays at all, organic or whatnot. So we're just trying to create a complex uh, ecosystem to be our primary barrier against pest introduction. Gotcha. So we'll have our lettuces amongst the, the scallions, for instance. And then what's nice is, especially with your onions and garlic, which might take a little bit longer to grow, uh, once you harvest the lettuce, it opens up that bed space to start your summer crops. Tomatoes, peppers, mm. cucumbers and you get your crop rotation built in automatically, as well as the pest resilience all in one. So it's- You really got this dialed in. How, how long have you been farming? I'm not trying to ask sure. your age, <laughs> but how long have you been doing this? So I started the farm in 2012 up okay. in, in West Michigan. We moved here in 2015, okay. which was definitely a big transition for the farm, trying to sell what we could up there, but retain what can be moved. It's hard mm. when you're, our largest asset is the soil. Yeah. And I think that mentality has been lost with big ag in particular, where it's just something to be expended. Yeah. So that's where from day one, we were like, okay, we have heavy red clay here in South Carolina. What can we do? Yeah. We reached out to the universities and found that Clemson University, which is just up the road, has a lot of compost. So, and it's leaf mulch that they took from the, com or from the campus and they piled it in massive piles, turn it every year. And so it's rich compost. So that's okay. where we started. Okay. And that's been cool. So, and it's 2014, so nine years in this location. I guess I'd be about four years prior experience up in Michigan. So 13 years. Where did you learn all of this pest control, organic ideas? Has it just been trial and error, intuition? Are you, re you said you read about farming. Mm -hmm. So where do you get all this information from? Unfortunately, there are not a lot of textbooks that write on this and our extension services still are working with pesticides. So yeah. a lot of it has been self-taught. There have been a couple of books that have been helpful along the way. Carrots Love Tomatoes, it's definitely oh, not, a, yeah. it's just a great introductory book. Yeah. It got me excited about the concept. And so that just got me on that trajectory. And then just going on YouTube, finding other farmers who had a similar farming philosophy. And it's interesting because we all have different flavors of it. Uh, especially pertaining to pest management and land management. Uh, but it's been just definitely something that each ecosystem is unique. So you, even though you might read it in a book or see what other people are doing, you really have to know what pests you're dealing with. Yeah. And unfortunately here in the Southeast, we have a lot of bugs because yeah. we don't get enough hard frost yeah. to kill that pest cycle. So trial and error, but it's been very encouraging with the results, especially seeing that it has created an excitement with local universities, Clemson University, the University of Georgia in Athens. Their entomologists have been partnering and sending students here to conduct research because there just are not enough farmers around here who are not using any spray whatsoever. Like we are not even using neem oil, for instance. Because it's such a, I guess raw might be the right adjective, a raw ecosystem, they are able to set up tr test trials just to see, okay, what are the impacts this is having on the ecosystem pertaining to your pest to plant ratio? And the numbers are off the chart. They've never seen this before, both in terms of the beneficials that just naturally come and the the how few pests we actually have yeah everything from your nematode levels to your your moths that lay the caterpillars uh for instance we had tomato or, or tomatoes in the greenhouse last season and we probably had 10 tomato hornworms over the whole season wow but it's because we already had an ecosystem where the parasitic wasp was there. already there yeah you're partnering with the university how did you get that gig did they just like come up and ask? They saw, you, they saw you at the farmer's market and they just came up and asked you or what? So part of it was actually just connecting with the students. So we okay. reached out to the universities because labor is one of the hardest things with farms. Yeah. How do you get consistent labor? Well, we didn't, we, it's good to have consistency, but we also saw great value in having students who are alive with vibrant ideas because it's easy to get into the mentality that you know everything. But from day one, I was like, we, we don't want to get into that rut of which you, we see so many other farmers get into that. And so bringing bright life. And many of these students went to pursue their doctorate or their masters. And that's when they connected us with the professors. Okay. So it was almost like a backwards transition uh, with the exception of the first interaction with uh, a professor who was actually in microbiology, which is fascinating just to continue to learn more about the complexities of the systems that there are and really how fragile they are yeah. in, in particular to 
as a human being, we can have a positive influence or a negative influence. Right. And it's hard because nature's almost like a pendulum. We can get it swinging one way where it feels really good, but oftentimes it crashes the other way. Yeah. So that's easy to do, unfortunately. What made you move from Michigan to South Carolina? Weather was definitely a contributing factor. The winter of 2014, we had 96 inches of snow. We lost sight of the ground on October 31st, didn't see it until Mother's Day. Ouch. Uh, we did do hydroponic farming up there. My parents were very gracious to actually give me part of their basement. So we did okay. like the herbs and lettuces that have high value when you can't grow them otherwise. But so the weather was definitely a large contributing factor. But another element was my grandparents lived in an in-law apartment in our basement growing up. And as they were aging, they were getting into their 80s. It was getting too long of a trip for them to go to Florida, which is where they would usually winter. And so we were also wanting to find a location that we could move to so they didn't have to worry about that move. Okay. Uh, as it was a lot of stress and it would take them yeah. sometimes a month or a month and a half to recover from that. Oh, wow. And so we're very family oriented, family centric. Yeah. I saw this as a positive move to enrich in their health. So that was really neat just to see that influence as well. So the whole family moved. That you, is your parents, your grandparents, your in law, or your, your brother in law? Uh, my your... brother in law and his family. So I have six siblings. There's seven of us in total. Wow. All but my eldest brother moved down here. So okay. The it was whole like a family just picked caravan. up and moved. Part of it is we did visit the upstate South Carolina area uh, really since I think 2004. Okay. For family vacations, okay. we knew we wanted to move south, but we were not sure when things would work out because it was primarily at that time for my dad if he was able to find a job because at that time we were very young. And so just to have everyone be able to like just pick up and move because especially 2015, yeah. most of my siblings had established careers. Right. But everything just worked out perfectly and wow. saw it as a positive move, especially since South Carolina with Greenville, it's an up and coming area mm. and it's incredible with recreational activities as well in terms of raising family. That's so. true. We have thoroughly enjoyed all of the camping we can go on and just outdoor adventures that we can do while we've been here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That sounds really stressful and I'm going to pinpoint on the farming part. You had an established farm with an established market mm -hmm. and a customer base. How did you justify that. I mean, for any farmer to say, I'm going to lose my primary source of income and rebuild it in a brand new place that I know nobody at, that's daunting. It is. Yeah. How did you do that? Like emotionally, physically? It's it's a leap of faith. That's okay. what it really is. Okay. But just knowing that it's it's easy to try to take a, a step and once you get comfortable to stay in that position. But I knew that, yes, this could be uncomfortable. But the opportunity for personal growth was huge. I did not meet, I did not have a wife up there yet and was waiting because there was a potential of a move. And I'm mm. glad I did that because I've met my wife, wife of Rebecca here in South Carolina. Okay. Uh, but emotionally, it was, it was definitely challenging. You have all those relationships. I'm an extreme extrovert, so yeah. I love people. <laughs> I've been to the farmer's market every week and we had an incredible customer base up there in Michigan. But at the same time, I knew that what's to stop us from replicating that. And so, when we got here in South Carolina, I just hit the ground running. I didn't really bear on it from a emotional or physical perspective, but hey, there's, there's a new opportunity here, especially since there aren't many farmers here in the upstate area. There at that time was a great lack of it actually. So did you do like market research to determine like where to go with like in relation to food desert or farmer's markets? Cause I know like, even my husband and I have thought about if we were to go somewhere and if we were to farm again, that we would want to be somewhere that already has a well-established farmer's market because mm. you can't just make a good customer base come out of the woodwork. So did you do any market research to, to determine this was the spot to be? Unfortunately not. Fortunately, <laughs> everything has worked out great. Yeah. The Greenville Farmer's Market, for instance, which is about a 40 minute drive from here. Greenville, South Carolina. That is correct. Yeah. So their downtown Farmer's Market on average will have between, I think it's five and 7,000 people come through on a Saturday. Holy cannoli. So to have a market like that, that close to us yeah. is incredible. And there is literally a 10 year waiting list to become part of the market. When I introduced myself to the market manager, they're like, we need to get you in here. So do they have a lack of vegetable growers? They did to a certain extent, but in particular young vegetable growers, oh, Okay. because here in South Carolina, the average age of a farmer is 65 years old. There were some others who were 
probably in their 50s, but they also see it in terms of investing in someone who has great longevity for the farmer's market, but also diversity, because yeah. we didn't want to do anything. We try to focus on the culturally important aspects, but then what can we do to diversify the market? And part of that was when we got down here, do good market penetration to figure out, okay, what is it that the community needs? One thing we found here was salad greens for okay. some reason and, and culinary herbs. Those two things, not many people do grow. Yeah. Even though both of them, as soon as you get your soil balanced, grow prolifically here. Okay. So that's been just unique to see how that's continued to influence our farm yeah. in particular, but the restaurant scene as well. That's slightly a little bit more intimidating walking into a restaurant unannounced. Yeah. Those cold calls. It's amazing because many of those restaurants I walked into that first week started to buy what we had and today are, are incredible customers week by week by week to the point where we have two who view us as they like the CSA model, but okay. they're like, how does that fit with a restaurant? Right. So they're like, okay, we'll just buy X number of dollars of produce every week, whatever it is, and we'll use it for our specialty uh, dish. So just having those relationships that have built oh. over time, it did take time to build that, but uh, you know, taking risks, yeah. stepping out there and just being, a, a, uh, it takes a, a certain level of confidence, but we knew we had a good product and we truly believed in our farming philosophy, uh, what our mission, vision and value was. So that's what definitely helped us with being able to articulate our story. So you said that you had it already keyed down, your mission, your vision and your hmm. values. What is that for your farm? So our mission, is to nourish our community through careful agricultural practices that nourish the ecosystem. So it's multi-fold. We're trying to figure out what can we do to do well with nourishing our community. We met so many people in our community, for instance, who have cancers because of continued uh, exposure to different pesticides, Roundup in particular. Their doctors were like, okay, if you, you have stage three lymphatic cancer, for instance, if you don't change your eating habits, you won't be able to survive. And so it's been amazing to have different individuals like that come to our farm and be like, do you use any sprays? And we can honestly say, look at our pack shed, look at our, uh, come visit the farm. We don't use anything. And to see within three months of just eating our produce, they're healed. It is powerful. So that's been really encouraging. But at the same time, uh, the values that we have, never to use pesticides or herbicides, staying debt free, which is very hard as a small farm, mm. but that's why we don't have a tractor. What's interesting with that, because that is a, oftentimes people view as a necessary uh, feature of a farm, it, it just shaped and shifted our farming uh, views of how do we approach fertility. So we're completely no-till as well, which has continued to build, especially with the companionship of research with mm -hmm. UGA and Clemson University. What is that doing to the soil? What right. is that doing to your nematode levels? So that continues to extrapolate and build into that. And then continuing to stay true to that. Oftentimes you can grow too, big, too fast yeah. and it's easy to be like, well, if I just use this or do that, it's, it's easy to shift. So we've actually created a document of which if it does not fit through this filter, we're not even going to consider it. What? That's interesting, especially for small farmers because it's so easy for a small farm to see immediate demand from mm -hmm. the community and be like, oh my gosh, I can't keep my leeks in mm -hmm. stock. They're constantly gone. We have to plant more. What does this document look like for you where if it doesn't filter through, you don't even consider it? What, what does it look like? So part of it is crop evaluation. If it is just not a sustainable crop due to particular pests, we won't consider it, even if there's demand for it. Pertaining to expansion, we had to stay true to no-till. With the first couple of beds, we did rent our neighbor's tractor, which was helpful just to do the initial tilling. It's amazing how many years we had to fight against it to break that hard pan. So yeah. now we know, okay, that's not an option. So then is what other natural resources can we work with to open up new beds? So it slowed the pace of growth, but another element that we've been trying to be very careful with is making sure that our raw inputs, compost for in particular, can we build on site, on farm to nourish our beds. And that has helped our scale in particular as well. This year we've actually downsized, but because we're doing better with our fertility management, it's amazing how much more we're actually able to grow. <laughs> as it can be easy to think, oh, okay, yes, it's a half acre. What if we had an acre? 
But if you're not managing an acre well, you're going to have the same yield as what you could have on a half acre that is well managed. Yeah. So that's been also something, what can we do? Not that, this is another one of our values, profit cannot be the number one end goal. So deeply embedded here. It is, it yeah. is. And through that, it's amazing. What we're learning here, we're trying to create a, a concept that anyone can take and replicate anywhere in the United States. And our goal is, on one acre of land, you can generate $200,000 worth of gross revenue and have that be a replicable system. Primarily from the basis that we need more farmers. We need to try to encourage people mm -hmm. to get back into this industry. Not growing too fast. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just wanna hit on that again because it's so easy for any business person to hit that, like just wanna grow, 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 grow. It, with your business degree, I imagine that you were mostly focused on things like Fortune 500 companies and mm -hmm. um, like engineering type companies, not farming necessarily. Unless you, were you, was it ag business actually? I should ask that. It was not, but it was I just regular was business. Very blessed to have incredible professors. So I got my degree, mm -hmm. my associate's degree from uh, Grand Rapids Community College. Interestingly, they pay professors very well there. So they had incredible professors there. Uh, my first class was actually how to start a business plan. So okay. I built it off the concept of farming. They were so excited about someone interested in farming that they shared it with the other professors. So if it was marketing, they enabled the freedom to, okay, what does it look like in farming? Wow. So just to have almost That's like amazing. specifically catered to what my interests were, through that it opened up different opportunities. They're like, this is so great. We need to try to inspire others. So I would speak at different classrooms when I was pursuing my degree, wow. uh, which, which was really neat just yeah. to be able to share my passion. And as I felt like it was an opportunity to really apply yourself for it can be very easy, especially in education, just to like go through it with an apathetic pers or perspective of, okay, I'm just gonna get this done and get into the workforce. But if you have rather a perspective of, okay, what can I do to have this fuel my life with joy and happiness and continue to yeah. try to orientate myself in a perspective that will serve me well for the life to come. You're really enriched in your community and off camera before I started rolling, you mentioned that you're working on another program. Mm -hmm. You're introducing other people to farming. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so it's multifaceted. One very yeah. important component has been students, first, first and foremost. People who are in their formative years, especially college or even high school, partnering with them and letting people know there's a, a place for them to facilitate that. But another area that has opened up, primarily through an organization called Project Victory Gardens locally here, has been for veterans. So people who are either retiring out of the military or transitioning from military to uh, back to regular life, what does that look like? And oftentimes there's a lot of stress with the transition. So this company or this organization's goal is to basically facilitate that within the realm of agriculture. So we have partnered with them and uh, it's a paid internship through the military, whether it's Air Force, Marines, or the, uh, or the Army. So we don't have to worry about the finance side of things but rather on what can we do to enrich in the life of this individual. So it's, it's similar to a normal internship program where it's, it takes more intentional time. We're trying to teach these individuals and some of them are really passionate about agriculture and want to get into farming. Others, it's more of, okay, this is a, a peaceful environment where they can decompress mm. and really focus on mental health during yeah. this time period. So it's a three month internship and it's been really powerful just to see people who have come through this program come in with a lot of burden and stress and come out of it a completely new person, different perspective of life. And so that's been really encouraging just to see the power of agriculture. If people just get their hands in the dirt, yeah. how healthy that is both for the mind, the body, but uh, just being able to reorientate yourself with your perspective to community. That's really cool. So how many internships or interns do you usually have in one season then? So it's a very new program. Uh, we had one intern last fall and we have one more that just started up. It's a three month internship. Through this program, it is, since there are so many farmers who are interested in the program, they limit it to one intern per farm per season. So having a second one, we're, we're very blessed to have that already because yeah. I think there's, I'm not sure, there's probably 30 or 40 farmers who are looking for it. Wow. But there aren't enough people in the program for everyone to have a, a, an intern. 
So that's where we've also actually just this past week started an internship program with Clemson University as well. Just trying to make it easier for students to access this type of experience while contributing towards their needs for their education. So very cool. And the fact that it's paid for from the military Indeed. is so nice and less burdensome for you. It is. Yeah. And it, it definitely has enabled us to focus more on the individual. And really, it's changed our mentality with each individual who works for the farm. It's so easy to just look at numbers and be like, okay, if they're not doing X or Y or Z to a particular extent or achieving so much monetary income for us mm. that, okay, we can't do that. Now, there are economics to business, but there's so much more to that, especially within the relationships you build with these individuals, where our perspective is, it's okay if you're not, you know, as efficient or as effective as uh, this person or that person, but rather you're happy. This is fulfilling your life. You feel like this is a place where you're investing in something that you believe. In. Yeah. And so that's, it's changed our perspective and philosophy. So, and which also input are going back to like the farm size, it impacts how large of a farm do we need? And yeah. part of that is what are the needs of our employees and for the business partners and our families? And it's easy to get into the, the mind where we just have to keep on getting bigger. But what if rather you view what are our needs and let's grow to that extent. And then as more people join in, we can expand. There's just so much wisdom and ideals here that it's, you usually don't hear unless you're talking to somebody who's retired from the business mm. and like, yeah, this is what I learned over my 40 years of experience. And you're saying, no, I've, I've kind of got it figured out and I'm sure you're still learning things mm. and things Indeed. change, but it just is really cool that you're able to, to provide such positivity to your community. And if we can go back to it too, a community that you didn't grow up in. Right. And so you say my community, you've been here for nine years. That's a long time. Mm -hmm. But when you're getting into that, was there any like intimidation about the barrier to entry that you're like, I'm not from here. I'm not one of them. I don't speak the same, you know, being from Michigan, coming all the way down to the deep south. I mean, uh, that's, <laughs> I'm so. sure you stuck out like a sore thumb because oh, I know I do. <laughs> extremely so. Yeah. Everything from your accent uh, sets you apart. But like, we just have a different mindset in the north where you, the goal is to get from point A to point B as fast as possible. It is production driven, 100%. Here in the yeah. south, people take time. I remember yeah. the first time I walked into a Lowe's, Random stranger came up to me and started talking about Clemson football. In fact, it's 196. <laughs> it was a 45 minute uh, discussion. That's hilarious. So I love it because like it slowed us down. Yeah. Because I'm definitely, uh, personally, I'm extremely energetic, love to get things done and work hard. Uh, yeah. If I'm going to be doing something, I'm not going to put, you know, 50% in. I'm going to put 110% in yeah. all the time. It's just my perspective of life. But it, there was definitely some challenges. It's a different culture completely. And being from the North, there's still some tension there, which is fascinating to observe as well from like a cultural what? perspective. More of, oh, you're, you're a Yankee. Uh -huh. so, but it's amazing how fast that dissipated. And I think part of that was my willingness to, well, and also flexibility just to immerse myself in the community, in the culture here. It did help that I really enjoyed history as well. So I knew a lot about the history and the yeah. tension that was here in the upstate and really the deep south in particular. I think just having an open perspective and also being an extrovert, but at the same time being good at listening because okay. people like to talk down here has really helped. So for instance, some of those first cold calls to the restaurants, there was one chef in particular, we talked for an hour. Wow. It was amazing. And it wasn't just about farming or the restaurant. It's what his passions were, what my passions were. So we instantly, it, it's... It creates a deeper bond than just a business to business relationship. And that's really what has connected us with the community so well. Even at the farmer's market, it's hard when you have so many people coming through, but there's probably a dozen people at least every week who I'll purposely pull myself aside and spend 15, 20 minutes just talking with this individual. Wow. As if you just view it as business to business, it's going to be informal. You're not going to build the depth of relationship. But what I found is since we spent that time building relationships, building friendships, they are truly my friends. And we had some hardship last winter. We got, we had a cold front. Here in the South, we don't get into the single digits very frequently. We got, we were in the 60s and it dropped to seven degrees wow. within a 48 hour period. Ouch. Lost 100% of our crops. Oh no. But because we had these friendships, one of the chefs handed me a check and said, this is seed money. Don't worry about paying back until you have spring produce. So community, 
it's wow. so rich. They want you to to thrive, and it's that. I love what you say say about how it's more than a business to business relationship. That chef handing you a check, that wouldn't happen up north. No. It just no. wouldn't, <laughs> you know? And and I don't mean that in a rude way or like the north is bad or anything, mm -hmm. but you're right. It is viewed as a business to business relationship. And if you don't have it, I'll go find somebody else who does mm -hmm. because I need to run my business. That's totally validating. I understand that. And I don't even yeah. I don't think that's bad. But for that chef to be like, hey, I really want you to succeed, buy some new seeds, and we'll talk about it in the spring when you can get me more product. That's amazing. It is. So is it, I know being an extrovert, you know, just kind of comes par for the course, but is it difficult at all to like maintain those relationships? Does it just come naturally? It comes naturally. Yeah. And it's, it's really both directions that's the amazing thing is it's not just me texting them or calling them hey how are you doing but they'll text and call or and they'll be like hey i have this exciting news my son's getting married and so they like little things like that that we get to participate in joy and so yeah. we, uh, sharing in that enthusiasm but also having the posture of empathy and being sympathetic when there's hardship in their family as well so uh through the highs and lows that's where i feel it's like truly like a close friendship because both the highs and lows are experienced together and and through that as well as just taking a posture of humility which is hard in the business world because it's like i can do everything myself but no if we just approach things with humility it's so much easier to come alongside or by someone and through that as well has been not different opportunities to really give back to the community. Mm -hmm. There's a great organization, for instance, called Feed and Seed, which their goal is to try to eliminate the food deserts in the area, which there are vast and many here in the upstate, yeah. which is hard. And so they're taking our produce. We'll purposely like price it wherever they need it to be, even if we're not making money on it, just to get our local produce in the hands of the people who need it. Yeah. So it's powerful to see that. And for that's where our heart is, is it's not our pocketbooks, it's community. But obviously you are financially successful here. Mm -hmm. You are doing well, you have good relationships with people who are able to pay the value that you have here. Do you see that as a difference from being up north? That like, are, are people willing to pay different prices down here versus, or, I won't necessarily say mm -hmm. down here, but in this area versus where you were before. It was definitely challenging when we first moved here in particular, because here in the South, oh, I don't want to pay $3 for heirloom tomatoes. I can get it for a dollar from the grocery store. Yeah. That's the mentality of, especially those who grew up here and live here, because we are in a, it's a fairly impoverished area. But there's so many people who've been moving to the upstate, especially from the number of Ohio, Ohio or New York, Maine, even California. So there's a, such a diversity here in the upstate now that uh, there's enough people to carry the, what we need to get paid uh, up top. But at the same time, we're trying to price it in such a point, and this is where the business side of things has really helped. We know our cost of production with each individual crop down to the penny. In high or low, we build in margins purposely just right. to make sure, okay, we can't predict the weather. We don't know what's right. going to happen. There might be a hell storm, we lose the crop. So what is our value output? And then how much of a profit margin do we need to get? And rather than viewing it as we're gonna maximize that, how can we price it in such a way to maximize the number of people who can access this food? So it's a different philosophy. And that's where part of the mentality as well as, okay, if we can lower our cost of production, that doesn't mean we're getting a larger profit margin necessarily. As long as we're getting the profit margin we need, let's lower our prices. Food accessibility is, is critical. And access to clean, wholesome food is hard. How did your customer base respond to that? When Complete and utter shock. Hey. All prices, all farmers continue to go up. There are certain yeah. things, if it takes intensive packaging, we do purposely increase that because we're trying to keep conscientious of our environmental outputs okay. as well. But in other areas, they're like, why is this lower? Why is this cheaper? For instance, our eggplants and peppers last year. And we're just like, it's a plentiful year. So we're going to you know, spread that love and make it more readily accessible. But another key component has been with the mentality of lowering our cost of production, what can we do to uh, have as many inputs on the farm that we're adding to the soil? Since the soil is our number one asset, that's compost. So our urban farm plot in West Greenville, for instance, mm. this is our second year that we have six, or going into our second year, where 100% of the inputs into that farm is being made on that farm. Wow. So, which is hard. Yeah. It's risky. 
but we're finding that there's enough diversity, especially with how we're doing our composting system, to enrich the soil and nourish the crops that we need and getting incredible yields. If anything, yields are going up, which is almost counterintuitive, but it's been spectacular just to see that. What happens, and this is probably the northern in me here, what happens when you have to raise your price? What, what's your customer response to that? Uh, so far, there has been no turn back. Like, for instance, packaging costs in particular during COVID doubled in cost. What yeah. would have been a, like a clamshell for packaging salad greens went from 30 cents to 69 cents. We can't just shoulder that when we're doing, you know, 200 or 300 clamshells a weekend. But there was, there hasn't been one customer who has been like, why did you raise your prices? But rather, it's usually customers coming to us and being like, why aren't you charging more? It's hard because we don't have a certification. So many people ask, okay, yes, if you're organic, but because we're so transparent with our farming practices, they're like, this is better than organic. <laughs> so you should be able to charge more than organic. But really, if you look at our prices compared to grocery stores, whether it's Publix or Ingalls, you'll find that it's very comparable, if not less. And that's definitely contributed to another element of our story that has become so pivotal is seed saving. Having a okay. story, even with like what we're doing for cultivating the, the culture around food. So in particular, we've been experimenting more on our homestead, uh, okay. but we're trying to see what can we do with that in, in the farm as well. What's amazing is the adaptability, especially as the weather patterns here have been fluctuating greatly. They mm -hmm. technically put us into zone 8A, but we're still getting hard frost into April. And that's hard here in the South where, yeah. okay, but later this week, we're gonna be almost to 80 degrees in March. And yeah. it's just challenging to have that. So, but what can we do to continue to well, and that's probably part of the business side of me. How can we tell our story more? What elements can we do to continue to enrich in that? And it's not necessarily to make more money, but it's to be able to articulate what we're doing more clearly, to try to inspire others. If it's to feed them, awesome. If it's to get them to farm themselves or start a patio garden themselves, that's great. And so uh, an element that has been very helpful with that is we used to outsource all of our seedlings to another greenhouse and they changed ownership of which was detrimental to both the quality and the pricing, oh, no. which is hard. But we were like, well, since that happened, let's do everything in-house. And the business relationships that have built through that, like all our potting soil mix, we get from a, a local company that is taking waste products in the agricultural industry. So coconut husks and rice hulls, mm. and then adding amendments and making this beautiful potting soil mix. It's been really just cool just to see how it, it contributes to that story. Yeah. Building community and continuing to what can we do if we have to outsource it? Can we buy locally versus continue to contribute to big ag? No, that's awesome. And I love too that you mentioned your urban farm. So this is your home farm. Mm -hmm. You have a homestead, an urban farm, but you're, you're doing something else too. And you're thinking about getting animals. That is so correct. How, oh, let's talk future now. Where are you guys going? That's been one interesting thing uh, in particular as our needs are changing. My wife and I are now expecting. Aww, so having a little one, so that definitely provides particular time constraint. Oh yes, it does. Yes, so <laughs> my mornings start at five o'clock every day and it's been great, uh, very easy to work a 10 hour day. So I'm putting in, with when the market season is in, uh, 60, 65 hours a week. Wow. Uh, I love it, it's, yeah. it's energizing. And I have energy to spend at the homestead, but that's going to need to change. So here, I don't know if we'll, ex we might expand one more zone outwards, especially since more people are interested in joining the farm. So that's been really encouraging. The urban farm plot has been awesome just to continue to diversify. One thing we have found is having three farming locations has greatly lessened the amount of environmental impacts, in particular hail storms or wind storms oh, from wiping out crops. Point. So it builds in resilience. Yeah. And resilience is something that's hard for small farmers in particular because your your geographic footprint is so small. Mm -hmm. So that's been really neat. But then also from a pest perspective, we don't have any bugs at the urban farm plot because we're we're in the city. Yeah. There's it's there's literally uh, the landowner there has been so gracious. Uh, it's basically a, a CSA a week, and that's the the lease agreement for that property. That's really cool. So, and being able to, uh, we've worked with the NRCS to get greenhouses to uh -huh. continue to build resili additional resilience. So we're, we're actually with that going to be getting another greenhouse on site here. And we're doing a research with the USDA as well for rainwater conservation. So we'll be collecting all the rain shed from both greenhouses with gutters that will be on them wow. to analyze 
what positive or effect that might have on the crops, especially since we're on city water here, which is okay. terrible. So, oh, and, so it's treated and oh, oh and coming from the lake, there's there's so many chemicals that they're putting in it. Like we don't scarcely want to drink it, which is yeah. why we did it well at our property, which has provided an opportunity to analyze what are the differences that we can observe well water versus city water. Mm -hmm. And then this will enable us well versus city versus rainwater. So we're excited about that growth. That's really cool. Uh, we'll be getting more greenhouses on our homestead as well. We have a couple of garden plots over there. I think a lot of it is also going to be research oriented. So we're looking forward to conducting research in particular on how can you turn a raw turf of land into a, a thriving garden. Yeah. So Charles Downing is a YouTuber in England that we really like. More of like a well, he is a market gardener, but the way he starts his gardens, he puts cardboard down. Mm. Make sure that it doesn't have any dyes or tape or staples or whatnot. Right. We have an excellent source of cardboard here. The okay. local postal offices, which uh, they're everywhere in the United States, get these massive boxes. They don't have a single sticker on them. If they do, it might be one. Uh -huh. And we put that down. Worms come up. The bioactivity that you get underneath it is incredible. Yeah. So research oriented. Uh, additional animals. Here on the homestead, my parents... Rather than mowing a pasture, they're looking at getting cows just to continue to add to the biodiversity. When we first bought the land, we got some pasture pigs and rotated around because it was just a weedy pasture. Yeah. And a lot of broadleaf weeds in particular, your burdock, your milk thistle, mm. those cows decimated it. Unfortunately, there's a couple of hard pan areas where they wallowed pretty good, but yeah. that comes with the territory. You mean the pigs decimated it? Yes, that yeah. is correct. And they just flipped that soil. It was incredible. Uh, they were Gloucester black spots. Fast, okay. fast growers. Yep. They finished in, I think it was eight months at about 300 pounds. So. Nice. That's a good, <laughs> dang, that's faster yeah. than industry standard. That it is. In addition to that, so on the homestead, my wife and I have the Cottage, Cottage Farmstead, is the name okay. of the organization or the company. And we're wanting to just continue to grow as much as we can there for our personal needs and the family needs. So okay. uh, we have or we have three Angus heifers. Okay. Uh, we processed one last winter. They went uh, to freezer camp. Grass-fed, grass-finished, doing rotational grazing similar to Joel Salatin. Mm. So very intensive. We're moving them every single day to a new patch of land. What that has done to the pasture is incredible. Yeah. And we're, we're hoping that we can get some universities interested in that type of, uh, like, evaluation for research mm -hmm. just in particular when you look at other farms in the area where the pastures are suffering right now even yeah. though this should be a growth time and it's been quite shocking for a lot of people locally where we'll be like oh we're gonna grow this or that and they're like you can't do that we have clay <laughs> but if you treat the land well the reason we have such heavy clay in particular where areas have been farmed so much is I mean, it's been farmed for 300 years. We've lost all our topsoil. Yeah. But if you go into the woods, there's four or six inches of topsoil. Mm -hmm. People don't realize it takes 50 to 75 years per inch, though, to be built up. So that's where compost is essential. Yeah. And it's fascinating. At first, I was like, okay, if we keep on adding compost, it'll raise the height of the bed. Well, compost isn't soil. It just feeds the soil. So it just keeps on compressing yep. down and being fed. Which is why it takes 50 years to do exactly. an inch. Exactly. But now at any of our beds or on this farm or any of our farms, you can literally take your hand and dig down eight to 10 inches with your hand. Wow. Whereas if you try to do it in, your, in the clay, you'll break your hand. Exactly. Yeah. So. Oh my gosh. So many cool things for you in the future. And I can't wait to just keep following along with you guys and watch your story and see you grow. If you're interested in farming, take risks, yeah. take chances. It can be a, hard to take that initial first step. But the biggest classroom is where you're at. So even if you have an urban place, maybe consider microgreens or fresh herbs. Herbs have an incredible value. Right now for us, that ranges from 16 to $30 per pound. So like, wow. and it's, it's, the hardest thing is definitely going full-time. I had the advantage of, okay, I'm in college. I was already full-time. So yeah. I never had that ch challenging transition of working a full-time job because the majority of farmers around here have that full-time job with working on the farm full-time. So they're working 80 hours a week. You can see the stress it has on them. But even with that, just be willing to take chances, build yeah. community, and yeah, get your hands dirty. Yeah, I love that. Well, Nathan, thank you so, so very much for showing me around and talking with me and sharing your story. If there's any links that you want to include, we'll put those in the description below. And people can follow along on your social medias and things as well. So 
Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. What you're doing here is amazing. Yeah, thank you for this time. This has been great. Thanks.